Morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're doing our event for cold weather effects on nitrification and ammonia removal. Uh, we, have, we have a few handouts. You guys are going to be all bumped over to the handouts tab real quick where you'll get a PDF version of all the slides we're going to go through today. So going to be a handful of product sheets for applicable products. And you'll have the study for the restoring nitrification in wastewater. And then if you guys want to chat, just remember to pop back over to that, that chat tab. And real quick introductions. Uh, my name is Sailor. I'm a research scientist with Aquafix. Hi, I'm Deborah. I'm the microbiologist and resident nitrification expert at Aquafix. And I'm Tyler Benz. I'm one of the several technical service representatives here at Aquafix. And as we jump into the into this discussion, I want to talk about generally, you know, what is nitrification overall, so then we can really dive into the effects of temperature on nitrification. And so to start that off, we'll talk about what the importance of nitrification is in your wastewater system. And to put it plainly, it's it's to remove ammonia from your system. So you will have incoming ammonia from a handful of sources. We'll talk about here. Generally, that ammonia is going to be coming from organic nitrogens that are entering your system that are going to be broken down by other microorganisms and producing ammonia. And that's going to come from proteins, amino acids, and urea are all super common uh, organic nitrogen sources that are utilized by microorganisms and are going to produce ammonia in your plant that, that needs to be removed via nitrification. But when we, we talk about nitrification, really we're, we're talking about a very small group of organisms that exists in the overall system and populations of organisms in your in your plant and throughout the slide we're going to refer to general organisms in your wastewater plant that are not nitrifiers as heterotrophs essentially what that means is that they are uh, microorganisms that are going to utilize organic energy sources so they're going to break down organic components for energy and when we talk about nitrifiers as a group they are what we would refer to as autotrophs. So they're going to utilize inorganic sources, ammonia, for their energy. And that's really what we're selecting for, is that ability that they have to break down that ammonia and get energy from it. But one thing to remember for nitrifiers is that that is incredibly inefficient. They've hollowed out a very nice niche for themselves where there's not a ton of competition, but it's a difficult and energy consumptive process just to get energy out, taking two steps backwards for three steps forwards. And so when we look at our populations of microorganisms in your system, really only four to 6% of that population is going to be nitrifiers. And the vast majority of your population is gonna be just general heterotrophs that are gonna be breaking down BOD and other organic sources. And then additionally, we talked about that like difficult niche and that energy intensive niche that nit nitrifiers exist in. And that really expresses itself in the time it takes for nitrifiers to reproduce. I mean, you are, have doubling times of 22 to 48 hours, sometimes even longer for nitrifiers. And for your general heterotrophs, they can be doubling in as quickly as 20 to 30 minutes. So these are very big swings in numbers. And then when we zoom in on nitrification, we're talking about nitrification bacteria, really we're talking about two different groups of bacteria. You have ammonia oxidizing bacteria and nitrite oxidizing bacteria. The whole reaction for nitrification is essentially going from ammonia to nitrate. And this is two steps. Your ammonia oxidizers are taking it from ammonia into nitrite. And then you have a separate group of nitrite oxidizers that are going from nitrite to nitrate. And they kind of hammer home again how fewer nitrifiers there are than heterotrophs. We have some nitrifier ammonia oxidizers and nitrate oxidizer species listed here. And there are hundreds of thousands of heterotrophic species that you'll have in your wastewater plant. And this is probably all you'll have for nitrifiers. It's very significantly less diversity. And then again, really want to hammer home how few nitrifiers we ever have, how rare they are, and how not really diverse they are. We have a fluorescent image of flock here, and we can see that most of our nitrifiers are sticking on the outside because that's where they like to be. They need a lot of oxygen. They need to come into direct contact with ammonia and nitrite in order to do their thing. So when you have this three-dimensional flock that is, you know, a community of different organisms that are all doing different things, your ammonia oxidizers and nitrite oxidizers essentially are just sticking to the outside of that flock. 
and that's where they're going to do their work. And so that also kind of comes in. If you don't have healthy flock, you're not going to have great nitrification. They need that home. They need that flock. Now we're going to start coming into some problems that can arise. Really one problem that I want to zoom in on specifically is a problem that arises because of that sort of two-step nitrification process where you have ammonia oxidizers producing nitrite and nitrite oxidizers producing nitrate. You can get something called nitrite lock. Since your nitrite oxidizers are reliant on a product produced by your ammonia oxidizers, sometimes there can be a lag in the population growth of your nitrite oxidizers, and that can lead to your ammonia oxidizers eating up all the ammonia, producing a bunch of nitrite, and that just kind of getting stuck in your system. Now, generally, this will resolve itself in, in a bit of time. If it doesn't, then and you have sustained nitrite in your system, that's, that's definitely something to, to be concerned about. In the short term, having elevated nitrite in your system can lead to a number of issues, one of them being a chlorine sponge. So generally, if you, if you chlorinate for filament control or you chlorinate for disinfecting, that nitrite can react with the chlorine before it does what you want it to do. And so it can lead to chlorine sponge. So it's leading to that chlorine having less effectiveness. And sometimes that can result in having like elevated coliform limits in your, your effluent. I want to talk about uh, the nitrification wheel real quick. I'm not going to go super in depth into all of these, all of these things, but I think it's really important to remember that your nitrifiers are going to be the last thing you're going to establish in your plant. And they're going to be the first thing that goes. They're very sensitive. They do a very important job in the wastewater system. And here we have a nitrification wheel, which is essentially going through all the requirements. You need the correct amount of alkalinity. They utilize alkalinity as a carbon source, as well as to counter the natural acid production of nitrification. You need, they require a lot of oxygen, almost four times as much oxygen to break down uh, ammonia as your regular heterotrophs need to break down carbonaceous wastes. It needs really solid pH. If you get too low, nitrification stops. If you get too high, nitrification stops. You need a good, good temperature, generally. It could be a wide range, but if you're looking to speed up that metabolism, having warmer temperature is generally better. And their nitrifiers are incredibly sensitive to toxins. So we want to make sure that you have no incoming toxins into that system. And the title of our webinar is Cold Temperature Effects on Nitrification. So as I've said a couple times, nitrification is a complex process and it's not very efficient and it is a metabolism that can be really heavily affected by cold weather. It gets colder, they slow down, they grow slower, they reproduce slower, they remove ammonia a little bit slower. But one thing to remember is that even though their growth rates are reduced and their ability to consume ammonia is reduced, they tend to have the, this ability to acclimate over time. So in prolonged, colder, less than ideal temperatures, maybe you can get to normal ammonia removal, normal nitrification. But the main issue is when you have big temperature swings from week to week, where it's getting warm, it's getting cold, it's getting warm, it's getting cold. And the nitrifiers, they, they don't really know, they kind of get stuck in a metabolic limbo where they're not able to know whether or not they should be producing the enzymes that they need when it's cold or the enzymes that they need when, it, when it's warm. Okay, well, I think that was a great overview on the basics for nitrification and nitrifying bacteria. We do have a poll coming up here, so if you could just all quickly switch over and check out that poll. And once you're done uh, putting in your answer, please remember to go back to the chat tab if you have any questions. We're really only going to see it if it's in that chat tab. I know people are still answering, but going off the responses that we're seeing right now, um, we often get calls around November to February about loss of nitrification. I think everybody's in pretty good agreement here. We're going to go into a little bit of the lab studies that we do here at Aquafix, see some of the effects of cold temperature and also how that can kind of compound something like an incoming toxin, such as quat or parasitic acid, PAA. Starting off in this chart over here, we did we grew up a bunch of mixed liquor in the laboratory, fed it with our own Smart BOD substrate, a very great nutrient supplement for your bacteria. And we took it at 20 degrees Celsius, which is kind of what our lab normally hovers at. And then we shoved it into a fridge, which is about seven degrees Celsius. And then we were just measuring the effects that we saw. One thing of interest was looking at the percent of ammonia reduction we got. First, starting off just without any quat added, just taking that very healthy mixed liquor and going from 20 degrees Celsius to seven degrees Celsius, you could see that we actually used two different concentrations of mixed liquor. So the blue bars over there is at 
3000 ppm mixed liquor and the orange is at 2000 ppm mixed liquor. And this is because we know a lot of people tend to hold sludge um, going into those colder months. We've heard it gives a protective effect and that may be the case. Uh, again, here I stress this is laboratory grown mixed liquor that was very, very healthy. I mean, we're never going to see samples coming into our lab for analysis that are quite this healthy. But if you do have that really, really healthy sludge, you can actually see that even holding it at only 2000 ppm mixed liquor and doing that cold shock to it, your ammonia oxidizers are perfectly fine. There's no fall off in ammonia removal. Now that changes when you start adding something, a toxin like quat. So that middle bars there, you see 15 ppm of quat was added. That was during the 20 degrees Celsius. And then we immediately put it into the fridge for seven degrees to shock them. And you can see that having that lower mixed liquor does make a bit of a effect here. So we do see a slight reduction in ammonia removal with the 2000 ppm mixed liquor versus the 3000 ppm mixed liquor. And that's at a pretty typical dose that we would expect to see quat being used at in most industries. Now going on the high end of a high dose of quat, 30 ppm all the way on the right there, it actually didn't matter what mixed liquor concentration we had when we did that code shock down to seven degrees Celsius, we lost quite a lot of ammonia removal capabilities. So that's kind of the effects of both quat and also how having something like cold temperature sort of compounds your effects. So this is also the same study using pretty much the same mixed liquor, lab grown mixed liquor that was very healthy. And we were just looking at 2000 ppm mixed liquor, mostly because we're seeing pretty good effects at 2000 ppm mixed liquor with 10 ppm of quat added to it as we were seeing with 3000 ppm. So we just wanted to magnify the effects we were seeing in the lab and use 2000 ppm of mixed liquor. Here you can see that at different concentrations of quat going from zero ppm there in that second bar from the left, once you start, you add a little bit of quat, five ppm, you saw a little bit of ammonia reduction kind of going away. And then at 10 ppm, you saw most of your ammonia reduction capabilities going away and 20 ppm kind of just killed everything out for the nitrifiers. You can kind of compare it back with that previous graph, which was at uh, yeah, the 2000 ppm on the previous graph. All right, so then we were seeing the effects of combining two different but commonly used cleaning products in industrial waste. Um, so PAA is the parasitic acid and quat, again, the quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, these are used oftentimes together, especially in the food industry, because they want to get away from quat and PAA is a good viable alternative for them. But most people are still in transitionary phases. So you're getting some concentration of both of them coming in. And we just wanted to see in the lab, um, if we combine them together, are they going to have an additive effect? Are they going to have a synergistic effect? What's going to happen? So here we were looking again at our 2000 ppm mixed liquor of lab grown, very healthy sludge. And starting with that blue bar on the left, if you add 20 ppm of quat to that, you basically kill off all your nitrifiers. We started off at about 20 ppm of ammonia and we've remained at 20 ppm of ammonia. It didn't matter how much time we gave them to try to come back or reactivate or work. They just all kind of died. Next, that orange bar there, that's 20 ppm of quat with 5 ppm of PAA added. And we see the same effects with just quat alone. We got pretty much no ammonia removal. Uh, going down there to that very, very tiny bar, what we have there is no quat, um, just 10 ppm of PAA. Normally on our COD removal, the heterotrophs, if you add in 10 ppm of PAA alone or 20 ppm of quat alone, we were seeing the same effects as in terms of bad COD removal or reduction COD removal. So that's why we went with those concentrations. However, when we looked purely at just is ammonia being removed on the ammonia oxidizer side? If you add just 10 ppm of PAA, your ammonia oxidizers are honestly fine. They're removing ammonia and they're just sitting there happily. Just to kind of make it hard or just to see these effects, uh, we added the 10 ppm of quat combined with 5 ppm of PAA. That was also determined based on heterotrophic COD removal. And we saw that you got the same effects that you were seeing with quat alone. If you remember the 20 ppm of quat alone, the blue bar there, we saw pretty much no ammonia removal. We were stuck where we started at. When we added half that dose, the 10 ppm quat, 
Even with high PPM PAA added in that green bar on the right there, we saw about half ammonia removal from what we started at. So this is pretty much conclusive for us that PAA does not affect your ammonium oxidizers, but quat definitely does. So over here, just to illustrate it a little further, is we started off with looking at COD reduction and also correspondingly took ammonia removal as well. And if you look at that orange line going across there, um, starting from the left, we had no quat. Next to the right of that is 10 ppm quat. To the right of that is 25 ppm quat. And at the very end on the right there, that was a flask with 50 ppm quat added. Again, focusing on that orange line as our percent COD reduction, we saw even at 50 ppm of quat, your COD reduction marginally decreases. You're pretty much having pretty good uh, COD removal no matter what, even with 50 ppm of quat added. However, if you look at that blue line, that's our percent of ammonia reduction. We saw that at 10 ppm of quat, you might be okay, but anything over that, you're going to start decreasing your percent of ammonia reduction. And at 50 ppm quat, you pretty much stopped any sort of ammonia reduction. And this is probably because your ammonia oxidizers were either inactivated or were killed off by the quad. We also did the exact same tests and did our temperature shifts where we started them at 20 degrees Celsius and then put them in the fridge at 7 degrees Celsius. And you actually saw these effects magnified. So right around 10 ppm, you actually started to see your or ammonia removal starting to decrease. You were no longer hovering at that 100%. So that's kind of an illustration of how temperature or other adverse environmental effects can actually make other things like incoming toxicity worse. So here's uh, another chart here. Um, this was a fun little experiment we also did in the lab. This was using, again, our lab grown mixed liquor at 2000 ppm. That was very, very healthy. And what we had here was we let it grow for a little day just to kind of acclimatize itself. And then we hit it with a 10 ppm quat dose on day three. Um, waited two days to add our Vitastim Dynamic Duel. And we saw that with the Dynamic Duel added in that orange line, it took maybe another two days to start seeing ammonia reduction reestablish itself versus that blue line, which did not have any products added. Uh, it took a good like five, six days before you actually saw any sort of ammonia removal start to begin again. And this is actually in our paper that's in your handout tab. That was the very, very last handout, the dynamic dual in parentheses. So take a look at that and let us know if you have any questions on those. All right. So now that Sailor and Deborah did an overview of the nitrification process, as well as the uh, commonly associated issues with such, um, I just wanted to touch on a little bit of the services Aquafix provides and how you can remediate um, any sort of nitrification issues commonly dealt with at your facility. So real quick, if you want to head over to the Pulse tab again, we just got one more for you. So if you have lost nitrification in your past or it has been somewhat depleted, what measures have you taken to solve? You got a couple options there, wait it out, increase retention time, add bacteria, or if you select other, please uh, share exactly kind of what you've done in the past to, to do that. Yeah, so it looks like a majority of you um, either increase retention time, add bacteria, or simply just wait it out. So right here you see just a, a lovely picture of a cold weather wastewater plant. Obviously cold weather certainly deals uh, or contributes a lot towards uh, reducing ammonia removal in most wastewater systems as both Deborah and Sailor have alluded to previously. And certainly being in Wisconsin, Aquafix has helped work with a lot of these colder climate uh, facilities, um, whether that's adding bacteria or protecting it against other toxicities as well as the cold. So right here, as Deborah alluded to, she does grow our own version of nitrifier um, right here in our warehouse at Aquafix. Um, you can see some of the tanks there. We have a whole room set up for that. And as you can see, it is comprised in the uh, dynamic duo. So one part are those nitrifiers, the actual bacteria, that facilitates the nitrification process. Pair that with our version of our ammonia simulators. The ammonia simulators really just work to adhere the nitrifiers better to your to your flock formers and your wastewater systems. You don't get the nitrifiers getting in your system and washing out right away. So that's a little bit about the dynamic duo. Next up, we have our counterquat. Kind of as much of the presentation so far has talked a lot about toxicities and how they contribute to reducing your nitrifier population and subsequently reducing all ammonia removing effects. Um, Counterquat is a great food substrate, not only helps protect the bugs against, against quats alone, but also PAAs and really any versions of toxicity. It 
does a great job of mitigating any issues. So if you've had a plant that has gotten completely wiped out by a specific toxicity or varying degrees of other forms of toxicity, counterpot does a great job of mitigating any future upsets. Oftentimes it'd be like to use this before we introduce nitrifiers just to make sure um, the nitrifiers are going into a healthy and safe environment. And right here, just to recap again, um, since we are a lab first, microanalysis is uh, really, I say, our bread and butter of what we do here at Aquafix. A good rule of thumb, oftentimes if you are coming across an issue, regardless if it's nitrification issues, or really any issues, um, particularly settling, foaming, please send us in samples. It's always a great idea to get the best overall picture painted for you of exactly what's going on inside your facility and specifically microscopically. Um, what do your bugs look like? Are they healthy? Are they getting enough oxygen? Are there signs of toxicity? And from there, we can get you a good picture of, you know, where you should take your facility in terms of preventative steps, or if there are you know, any other things that need to be addressed, we can certainly provide those recommendations for you. So with that being said, um, that covers a little bit about our products. Um, and as we talked about in the uh, beginning of this presentation, uh, those are all available on the handouts. Um, one of the products that are included in the handouts that we didn't get to talk about is OxyFresh. That's just a liquid oxygen supplement that we provide. Um, kind of going back to that wheel that Sailor talked about, just one more of the steps that you can take to improve all the parameters that go into removing ammonia in your facility. It looks like we got a handful of questions as well that we've gotten throughout the presentation. We'll kind of start at some of the older ones and, and move our way through. So we have one here from Chris. What happens if I can't get my DOs below 4 ppm? Our new blowers are too strong and over aerate. In terms of nitrification, you don't really need to worry too much about too much, like more oxygen. Is it necessarily a bad thing for your nitrifiers? What I would be concerned about at 4 ppm consistent of, of DO is your energy bill and then also shearing your flock. Really, you're going to look at indirect damage to nitrification just by over aerating, shearing your flock. You're going to get pin flock. They're not going to settle well, but you, you really might not even, that might be one of the few cases where you might not see a huge hit to your general nitrification. More of that will harm the other functionality of your plant. All right, so I got some questions here. What is quat? Uh, it's a cleaning compound that's called quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, it was really, really commonly used, but it seems like a lot of people are actually trying to get away from that since it turns out it's pretty toxic. And the downstream wastewater plants in particular are pretty upset if you put in a lot of it because it kills off the plant. Similarly, PAA, it's an acronym for a different cleaning compound that's being pushed to replace quat. PAA is parasitic acid. This one is not as toxic to nitrifiers as we've seen, but it can do some things such as lower your DO coming in because it is a compound that can be fully metabolized by your heterotrophic bacteria. So what if I have a lot of ammonia, 200 milligrams per liter, and about 300 milligrams per liter of BOD? Should have much higher fraction of nitrifiers, right? Yes, yes, you will. Your whole system is gonna be a living organism that's gonna adapt to what your incoming wastes are. So it's gonna select for certain species, certain uh, balances of populations that are gonna best consume the food that, uh, that it's being given. So if you do have higher ammonia coming in than, than normal, your nitrifiers, ammonia oxidizers and nitrate oxidizer populations will generally be a bit higher. They can get above that 6% point, but generally even in a system like that, you're going to have more, your population of regular heterotrophs are still gonna be higher than your nitrifiers. Where would you add the nitrifiers? So it's a good question. Both the nitrifiers and ammonia simulators in a standard activated sludge plant will be added at a daily rate uh, to your aeration basin. If you have more than uh, more than one aeration basin, you can split the dose evenly. Um, and of course, the, the recommended dose rate can be found on those handouts that are attached uh, over to the right of the chat page. For an SBR, to get a little more specific on it, you do want to add during the fill cycle specifically, just because we want to ensure, kind of going back to that wheel, we want to ensure that it does have ample oxygen um, as soon as possible. Do you have labs in Canada? So actually our lab is based out of Madison, Wisconsin, but we do service not only just across the country, but also Canada, Mexico, and we've done numerous uh, service uh, jobs out in Middle East, 
New Zealand, just about all across the world. Can I use Duo in my sand filter slash bio tower? What is your experience? Yes, I've seen people do it. The one concern with sand filters or bio towers is a lot of times if they've been running for a long time, they have a buildup of a lot of gunk and grit and stuff, and that can actually inhibit oxygen transfer into the bacteria. So that might be one concern. But otherwise, in a generally well-functioning or relatively cleaned out sand tower or bio tower, you can definitely add dual and it will help in your process. A few questions. What if we can't get our DO up to four milligrams per liter? That's fine. So when you get to around that four mark that you're going to see great results, but it is incredibly difficult to get up there with general aeration in your system. You'll get nitrification working fine at lower DOs. Like two to three is going to work fine. I would try to stay away from anything below two. When you start treading below two, you're going to start running into problems, not just with nitrification, but with other processes in your system. How much duo would be needed for a 10 MGD plant mixed liquor, 1200 milligrams per liter? Not only is flow rate going to play a part of it, play a part in the dose rates, but also temperature will play a big part. I would highly recommend this if you want to head to the handouts page, the Dynamic Duo product sheet on the back side, it'll actually have all the dose rates broken down for the respective dose rates based on uh, both flow rate and temperature. Uh, good rule of thumb, generally, as you get colder in temperature, more duo is required. We have an SBR plant, and when our tank temps get below 56 degrees or so, our ammonia goes way high, and we aren't able to keep our MLSS down, or MLSS above 2000, because then we have is settling issues. Any advice? It's really hard to say. I mean, 56 degrees, you should still generally be getting good uh, ammonia removal. I would, honestly, for this one, I would say maybe send us a sample. We can take a look at it. You might have other issues going on as far as what your flock structure looks like and things that might be causing your kind of your your nitrifiers to just barely be keeping up with your incoming ammonia so when you have even a slight shift in temperature like down to 56 degrees it'll just it'll kind of push it over that edge now looking at it microscopically is always a good place to start because uh, sometimes it's more an issue of at 56 degrees Celsius or well Fahrenheit, your flock forming heterotrophic bacteria might actually not be working as fast as they would at say 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So that could be part of the issue is just, you're not getting as much time in the aeration portion for the nitrifiers as you would in a warmer temperature. Uh, your website says that Duo guarantees full recovery in six to 10 days. Can you elaborate on that guarantee and warranty? As long as you meet, as long as your plant meets all the parameters that are given in that wheel and that your plant is otherwise operating on a completely normal level, meaning that you're still getting COD removal or BOD removal, still have adequate oxygen, good pH, and adequate alkalinity, and nothing else is wrong mechanically. If you were to introduce duo, we do fully expect um, ammonia removal on the back end to go down back down to zero. Our plant is odd running a DO of one and get complete nitrification. I would question uh, where exactly you're, you're pulling your DO measurement from. Sometimes that can have a big impact or where in your cycle if you're an SBR, um, things like that. But it, like I said earlier, it's, it's always good to remember that your your system overall is very adaptive. You know, it's all it's alive. So it's going to do what it can to try to be functioning well. The problem comes when your plant might be struggling, maybe not uh, explicitly, you might not be able to see that it's struggling at a, at a DO of one, but if you were to say have like a, these issues all compound. So if you were to have like some toxicity come in or it would suddenly a cold snap, it, it kind of becomes more than the sum of its parts in, in how it can negatively affect your your system. And just having a cold snap, you might wipe out a lot of, you might go from a functioning plant to a plant that just doesn't work at all. You're fighting low DO issues as well as 20 degree temperature swings at once. What steps can we take to de to stabilize our process? Number one would be to, you know, figure out what is causing these low DO issues. Is it, are you having air issues with your aerators? Are you having issues with uh, anything upstream could be a whole number of things. Are there is there septic waste coming in, or I should say, a high majority of septic waste coming in? Could be a number of things. The best thing would be to get a grasp on you know exactly what is causing the low DO issues. 
you de do need artificial supplementation. That's where the OxyFresh comes into play. Unfortunately, temperature swings, not really all too controllable, but certainly something like Counterquad is great at stabilizing it's from any of these toxicities coming into your plant or any issues. It's a great way to give the bugs a little more added protection. How does F to M ratio come into play with nitrification? F to M ratio is pretty expansive. So we're talking food to microorganisms. Generally, when you have your lower F to M, you're gonna have an older sludge. This is kind of like a multifaceted thing that's tying together and even tie into like MCRT and holding more sludge going into like colder months. Generally, I would say that general F to M when it, when it comes in a system is a little bit detached from nitrification since you're operating on a different incoming ammonia nitrifier population. But as we've said a couple times, it's a communal organization. So your heterotrophs are important to nitrification. So when you tend to have bad F to M ratios that are negatively affecting your heterotrophs, those issues also tend to affect your nitrifiers. Your, your flock maybe don't look so well. And in the worst case scenario, when you have really bad F to M, you can have growth and death cycles with, with old sludge where eventually your flock can just disintegrate. And if you don't have flock, you're not gonna have nitrification. And, and that's really the crises that you wanna avoid is flock disintegration. What are common examples of quat? Honestly, they all have their own product name. So it's a little hard to tell you uh, exactly what it is. Um, a lot of them are just going to be generically on their SDS, say they're used as a biocide or a cleaner. Most commonly, they're going to be used in food industries. So if you have any food manufacturing, industrial plants upstream, try and get in there, try and get all their, their SDSs and start looking through them if you have any suspicions that they might be dumping clot down the drain to you. What effect will citric acid have on nitrification? Specifically citric acid, I'm, I'm not I'm not really sure. Um, it depends how much, I guess, would be would be the main question and also what its impact is on the pH. We kind of talked pH a little bit earlier. One thing to remember about nitrification is during just the process of nitrification, those nitrifiers are releasing acids that are constantly pulling the pH down in your system. And so that's why it's important to have that alkalinity present so that your alkalinity can counter that acid production and keep pHs a little bit above neutral, like 7, 7.5, and keep them around that point. So I, I'm not sure if citric acid is directly inhibitory or uh, damaging to nitrification, but I would say if you're getting a lot in and it's pulling that pH down, you're gonna have you're gonna see issues in nitrification, and you're probably gonna see issues in, in, in other areas of your plant as well. And real quick, that actually ties into another question we have here. We'll get back to the OxyFresh question after this, but uh, where should my pH be for optimal nitrification? What is the best way to stabilize pH? Um, once again, going back to the wheel and the sailor alluded to, it's real general rule of thumb. A good safe operating level is 6.9 to about 7.9 neutral. Best way to do it. As for supplementing pH sub substitute, strong base, we do have our boost and lock. It's a combination of several different strong bases. Um, really use mainly so because it has a very high alkalinity measurement. Um, so it's a really good way to increase pH while also being able to stabilize pH. Um, so more so looking at getting some sort of alkalinity substitute in there. Yeah, and the balance of those bases are going to make it so um, you don't really have to worry about adding too much. You're never going to overshoot that healthy pH. It's going to tend to stabilize around that neutral mark. How does OxyFresh work? We have a daily flow rate of about 40 MGD. Um, so OxyFresh is really as it says it is, it's uh, a liquid oxygen supplement. Um, so rather than using an aerator to blow air into your system, we just have our OxyFresh where it's just simply adding in a liquid source of oxygen to increase your DO. Um, and once again, for any sort of uh, dose rates, please feel free to head over to the handouts page, um, specifically the uh, OxyFresh liquid page. We'll have more generalized uh, dose rates for you on the backside. Um, and if you'd like, uh, feel free to call in and, and your technical service rep would be more than happy to get you more specific dosing. And same goes for all of our products as well. Oh, interesting question here. Is it known if the genes that dictate the enzymes responsible for nitrification metabolism are carried on a plasmid? Mm -hmm. It's known, and they are not on a plasmid, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. If they had been, you could definitely transfer it between other bacteria, and you would have multiple copies. Unfortunately, these are just within their genome, so low copy number. 
And it's also with, with nitrification too, um, they, they do have a complex mem membrane structure as well. So it kind of goes above and beyond just like shooting that, like that nitrification gene into like an E. coli. It definitely needs uh, a set of sort of membranes behind that cell wall where it can have that, that inorganic reaction take place with that uh, moni monooxygenase, that enzyme that's really gonna drive that, that metabolism. We have lagoons as does our neighbor in city. Last winter, we were both in nitrification at the same time. We are aerated and they are not. We both had the CL2 sponge going on. Our temps range from 30 to 60. We waited it out, then went on for approximately two weeks. What can we do if this happens again? Good question. So lagoons will operate a little differently. And I did see uh, in the chat a little bit, there are there were other questions about lagoons. That one we won't be covering in this presentation, but we'd be more than happy to talk about it if you want to call in. Long story short though, with lagoons in particular to or pertaining to ammonia removal, it's a little more tricky to introduce the duo as that's such a wide body of water, gets a little tricky. For that, really the best recommendation is to look at something more so of our Vitus and Lagoon line or uh, Sludger X in really looking at a long-term solution to your lagoon. Most of those nutrients, specifically ammonia, is going to be stored at the bottom of the lagoon. We want to go after that, attack the sludge at the bottom so that you can remove all the nutrient loading inside the lagoon, ultimately reducing um, ammonia on the back end as well as BOD, TSS. Um, but once again, feel free to call in. We'd be more than happy to go into more details about, about lagoons specifically. Do you supply products in India or Asia? Yes, we do. We've supplied products all over the world. That one, we would once again recommend you calling in just to make sure details can get arranged, things like that. Please, can you refresh on the benefits of nitrifying bacteria and what is good range? What is a good range for the system to be normal? Well, your, your nitrifying bacteria are good for removing ammonia and ammonia being one regulated effluent uh, measurement, but also ammonia is toxic, right? Ammonia is bad. We don't want to be discharging ammonia into our, our rivers and streams via wastewater. And uh, it just so happens that there's a lot of proteins and urea and organic nitrogen components that are just naturally being turned into ammonia through the through the wastewater system. And ultimately it ends up in your, your wastewater plant or is produced in your wastewater plant. So it's a, as that last kind of bastion between you and the streams and the environment, it's important to make sure that we're removing that ammonia. As far as what, what could range for normal is, it's, it's really hard to say. We, your municipal plants are going to be all kind of a little bit different um, and your industry plants are all definitely going to be uh, different. It, it's really hard to hard to say what the a normal system is. Honestly, every system is so different. It's really just, you're going to find kind of a feel for it, I, I guess is the only way to say for what is a normal range for you. Any advice if the weather is hot and ammonia is hard to control? Any product you recommend? It's a little rare to see ammonia issues in summer, specifically more of the warmer months. Um, however, it's something that's definitely can happen. I would say that would be most likely due to either low DO issues or most likely any sort of toxicity coming through. Number one, I would double check and make sure that all the parameters in that wheel are being met. And then secondly, kind of going back to quads, PAAs, look upstream if there's any you know industry, really any business or household that may be using any sort of chemical cleaner that might have an effect on it. That's where I would start first. And ultimately, once again, I would say give us a call and we can get into more details. All right, so another kind of interesting question here is, have you ever heard of a nitrification issues being caused by addition of aluminum sulfate? It was being dosed to an anaerobic digester for a long period of time for struvite control and side stream centrate was being recycled to the plant. Aluminum in general is not that toxic to bacteria. You would need to get up to like the thousands of ppm for it, even for nitrifiers. The issue with putting a sulfate compound into an anaerobic digester is it becomes reduced in those anaerobic conditions and you're going to generate hydrogen sulfide, particularly because anaerobic digesters don't usually have a lot of extra iron hanging around. So iron would normally precipitate that sulfide, but in this case, um, that hydrogen sulfide um, might just be recycled back into the plant. And when it does that and hits the aeration basin, it's gonna suck out a lot of that dissolved oxygen. That might've been more the issue that was going on in this particular case. The question about an issue with high DO coming in from if influent. My DO is seven in the aeration basin and 
over two in the anoxic zone. Well, it's not really an anoxic zone if you have two, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and which is unfortunate, right? But um, might be the case where you're actually not getting in a lot of BOD, and this means that there's no, nothing really trying to use up the DO that's coming in. So it's coming in uh, at pretty much saturation with the ambient environment. You might want to look at what your incoming BOD is. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> really high. Yeah, first things first, I would make sure you're not, you know, adding in additional aeration because once again, kind of going back to, to Sailor, not only do you run into the issues of uh, possible flock shearing, but also just budget wise, <laughs> that's pretty expensive if you are adding your to that. Yeah, like Deborah said, I would say look into maybe adding additional food supplement or maybe even being able to reduce aeration significantly. Uh, how much alkalinity do you need? I think a good general rule of thumb is you, you want about like a seven to one ratio of alkalinity to ammonia that you're looking to remove. And when you should have about 50 ppm of alkalinity, just kind of neutral, like your bottom of alkalinity shouldn't be zero. You should have like seven to one, but then you should have a buffer of alkalinity in case you get extra ammonia in so that that can be dealt with. So there's a question here. Um, if I shut off my aerator for about 1.5 hours, Will the alkalinity increase when I turn the air back on? It's certainly possible. It depends on your act, what's going on in your system. So normally um, during the anaerobic phase, for sure, you do get alkalinity generated. Whether you're, that 1.5 hours is actually enough time to go anaerobic, and if you want it to go anaerobic is kind of a, a, a different question for that specific system. If our blowers were to go down, can your OxyFresh give enough O2 to compensate and continue nitrification until the power were to come back online. At a high enough dose rate, you can certainly temporarily add in enough oxygen to do so. But once again, it's only temporary. I would make sure to number one, have enough on hand, and then certainly have a plan to get your blowers back on as soon as possible. Can the duo and counterplot be used in nitrifying MBBRs? They can, but one important thing to think about is that your MBBR is going to be different, but your flow rates are an important thing, especially when adding uh, duo directly to your, your aeration basins. Sometimes your flow rates in an MBBR are going to be quite a bit higher and it's just going to wash that out. So kind of coming up with different strategies and how you could best use those products in, in your system is best. Sometimes if you have like a lagoon leading into the system, it can be better to add those to the lagoon and then kind of indirectly feed them through your, your aeration basin. Also with an MBBR, it's important to look at like what your, your uh, media look, looks like what sort of like uh, surface area you're working with. Because remember when we talk about nitrifying bacteria, they want to stick to the outside of, of things. So you want to make sure that you have plenty of surface area for those nitrifying bacteria that are, are in the duo to be able to be used with the media. As far as counterplot, Tyler, do you have any uh, experience with counterplot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. counterplot will certainly work as expected. Um, once again, it's really a modified food supplement. So anywhere you normally can introduce really any other food supplement, uh, counterplot will certainly be able to be used in that um, that scenario. Really any activated sludge plant to be more specific. All right, another question here. Uh, do you have a suggestion for an alternative to quant? So yes, um, PAA is paracetic acid, and that's been um, starting to kind of take over the industry as an alternative to clot. Our plant was studied and shown to have high levels of Kamamox bacteria. Do you have any insight on this? Well, I'm really glad to hear that you studied your plant and found <laughs> out your bacteria. I wish more people would. But yes, Kamamox is interesting, although it might indicate you might be running more towards that DO of two side. They also tend to produce a lot of slime, so maybe you have great flat formation or maybe you're just kind of having slimy flock. It's kind of hard to tell without seeing microscopically what, what everything looks like. Yeah, looks like we uh, hopefully answered all of your questions here. Um, so once again, thank you very much for attending today's presentation. Um, any questions that may come up after this or we didn't get a chance to answer, uh, please call us, give us a call, shoot us an email. We're always on standby to chat. Um, if you got any questions, would like to troubleshoot an issue or speak about any of the products we discuss here, more than happy to help. Our contact information is right there. Give you a time to uh, take a look at that. But once again, thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, speaking with you at the next presentation.